Hi everyone. Exciting times here today because look, I'm trying a new camera angle. Boy, are we excited. Another reason for excitement is I'm doing another movie themed video and I love movies so much that I, that's always a cause for excitement for me. So it being a very busy week, oh my gosh, I swear, I have never been this busy in my life. And kind of strapped for ideas, I thought, well, let's just do one that focuses, it's almost the end of the year, let's do one that focuses on um, some movies I have watched this year, and ones that I can heartily recommend for various reasons. There are 10 of them on my list, just because those, I happen to think of 10 that were pretty good. So uh, here we go. Going in no particular order, the first movie I'm going to highlight is a newer movie from 2022. This movie is, drumroll, Bones and All. Bones and All is a largely Italian production, but it was filmed in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Nebraska. Directed by Luca Guadagnino. I'm going to be mispronouncing a lot of names here. I am so sorry. Featuring Taylor Russell, Timothy Chalamet, and Mark Rylance. This one underperformed at the American box office, but it did win many awards. The story is about uh, two young people who find each other and it's romantic, but they also happen to be cannibals. Um, <laughs> like you do. I, I hope you don't. Oh my gosh. Okay, so it's like, it's not just cannibalism. It's shown to be an overwhelming compulsion, like a drug addiction, and it's hereditary. So Taylor Russell is a young lady uh, living with her father, and they have to keep moving from town to town because um, this compulsion keeps overtaking her, and then they have to leave town before, you know, she gets brought in uh, by the cops or whatever. Eventually, her, her dad just can't take it anymore. He leaves her. She's old enough to take care of herself. So he gives her some money and says, you're on your own. So now it's, you know, it's a coming of age story as well. So she starts out in the journey from town to town. And as she goes along, she finds uh, people like her. First of all, she bumps into Mark Rylance, who is this weird kind of creepy older guy. And being Mark Rylance, a fantastic actor, he just, he nails it. He's so interesting um and you want to see more of him but you kind of don't at the same time anyway he gives her some very important backstory as to uh their mutual condition she also uh bumps into timothy chalamet and they end up going on a road trip together where they fall in love and uh kill people at the same time it's been compared to bonnie and clyde and movies of that sort the cinematography in this film is very good. It takes advantage of a lot of the um, open roads that we get here in the American West and Middle West, too. This one was not my favorite. It's it's billed as like a romantic horror drama. I don't typically go in for either of those, but it's not heavy on either one, either romance or horror. And just as a, a told story, it works very well. Next one I'm going to highlight is Un Sandy, a Canadian production from 2010, directed by Denis Villeneuve. Uh, you may have heard of him, you know, some minor films here and there. The film stars, and I have to get my, my script here. Uh, the film stars, here we go, Lubna Azabo. Melissa de Moreau Poulain and Maxime Godet. This one was influenced by True Events and it was nominated for uh, Best Foreign Film at the Academy Awards. The plot of this film basically is there are a grown brother and sister whose mother passes away. And she uh, is originally from another country, they're French Canadian, and she is originally from an unnamed uh, Arabic nation in the Middle East. They do not know much about their mother's past, uh, nor their father. He was not in the picture. The letter she leaves them uh, explaining 
her past is, whoo, it's hefty. There is a lot there. And uh, the sister ends up going to the Middle East to uh, try and find out more. It turns out that they have a brother. And that's why she goes to try and find the brother. The big thing at the end, this is uh, set during, in, in, in the country, there is a big war and the mother takes a side in the war and ends up being like a freedom fighter. She assassinates somebody important and ends up in prison and being tortured for it really, really horribly. The big twist here is that she already had a son that nobody knew about. She had a baby um, when, she, when she was very young, and her brothers were, her whole family was mad at her. Uh, they didn't like her boyfriend, and her boyfriend wound up getting killed. Then she had the baby. Before any of this happened, the baby was taken and given to an orphanage, and she never saw the baby again. So uh, fast forward to later, she is raped in prison by her torturer and ends up having uh, getting pregnant again. And that's where the twins came from. They were a product of that. Hmm. The big twist at the end, and that's the shocking thing in her letter, the big twist at the end that I didn't fully understand. I didn't get all, all the nuances here when I watched it. And it was only in research for this video when I looked it up to refresh my memory. I said, oh, 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 oh. The, the baby that she had, her first baby, was put in the orphanage. The orphanage was um, overrun by um, freedom fighters or uh, whatever you call from t uh, terrorists, basically, I guess, uh, from one faction in the war. And they took the kids to raise as their own. One of the kids uh, uh, wound up getting hired by the prison as a torturer. It was her son. It was her son. So he is um, <clears throat> her son and also he, he's their brother and their father. It sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? It's quite a shocker. Um, so yeah, the twins find this out and um, their mother realized what happened only when she was older. They had moved to Canada and by chance, uh, the first son who was the torturer has um gotten an out he has himself moved to canada and taken up an entirely new life and put the old one behind him and they happen to meet one day she does not even greet him she can't bring herself to but she recognizes him by a mark on his ankle and she sees his face and realizes who he is and she dies soon after and at the end they write him two letters and drop them off uh, so they do not see him. Um, the first letter is to their father, condemning him for, their, for his actions. The second one is to their brother, forgiving him. It's, it's a hefty heck of a film. I mean, like I say, I, I didn't even get everything that was happening when I watched it, and it's still just very emotional and very good, very strong. Some very tough things. This is war and it doesn't flinch. And there are a lot of bad things happening to innocent bystanders. So it's a tough watch. I will just warn you uh, all that other subject matter um, notwithstanding. But still, if you're up for it, it's worth it. I did forget to mention at the outset here that um, a lot of these films um, have something in common. See if you can figure out what it is as I go along. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Next movie is Perrier's Bounty. This is a 2009 Irish film. It was directed by Ian Fitzgibbon, and it has Brendan Gleeson, uh, Killian Murphy, and also Jodie Whittaker, uh, the Doctor Who lady. I, I don't, I don't watch Doctor Who, but I, I recognized her. No awards or anything for this one, but it's not generally the type of film that gets them. It is described by its director as a gritty Irish Western, and I think that's a pretty good depiction. It also has um, Jim Broadbent as Killian Murphy's father. <laughs> a lot happens in this movie, and it's a little tricky to explain. 
Killian Murphy is a small-time crook uh, whose actions lead him to get on the wrong side of the parrier of the title, who is Brendan Gleeson. He ends up killing one of Perrier's gang, or one of Perrier's gang ends up dead because of him. I don't remember all the details. In any case, Perrier and his gang go after him, so he has to run for it. Along the way, he takes his dad, who is convinced that if he falls asleep, he's going to die, and uh, a neighbor who is uh, a girlfriend of one of their mutual friends, and her boyfriend is really bad to her, and in the process, she breaks up with him, and of course, gets together with Kelly and Murphy eventually. But there's a lot of netball parts to this. There's violence, of course, and um, there's some sweet parts, um, especially with Jim Broadbent as the father. And there are some funny parts also with Jim Broadbent as the father, but other parts too. It's just, it's, it's a ride of a movie. And I, I, it, the critics were hit or miss on it. I, I really enjoyed it. The Legend and Butterfly. This is a 2023 Japanese film directed by Hiroshi Otomo and starring Takuya Kimura in his first toy film and Haruka Ayasa. This film is also lightly based on true events that have kind of passed into Japanese lore, if you will, legend or lore. Yeah, one of those. So it takes place during historical events in Japan, and they're kind of light on the detail, so that can be a little confusing to foreign viewers, but then again, those details aren't really the focus of the story. So basically, Takuya Kimura, who is a big star in Japan and a very good actor, uh, he is a king's son, and at first he's, you know, kind of a spoiled brat and very irresponsible. He has an arranged marriage with another faction so they can kind of shore up their defenses against any enemies. Well, his bride arrives and she is not too taken with him and with the whole arrangement. So, of course, they start. It's basically an enemies to lovers type of thing. They do get married and they come to care for each other. She proves to be very smart and very, um, and really a better leader than her husband, tactically speaking. So, if it wasn't for her, then he wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And he does realize that. <laughs> This film goes through a lot of um, historical events. Even though it's light on them, it goes through a great deal of time over what this couple experiences and what they do. So that, that's my one issue with this movie is it's overly long. It really, it didn't need to be that long. Um, it is also uh, sad. There's a fake out. You think maybe there's going to be a happy ending, even though the happy ending doesn't make sense, but you're hopeful for it. It's a sad ending. It's a tragic ending, but beautifully shot. Very good movie. A lot of big Japanese actors in this, so if you watch a lot of Japanese film or TV, you will recognize a few people, or not recognize everyone, since a few people are in very heavy makeup, and it's kind of a spot the, spot the person, uh, which I found rather fun. Uh, but yes, overall, um, recommended for just a great epic story, good acting, and just beautiful shooting. Beautiful, beautiful shots in this. The Captain. This is a 2017 largely German but also co-production film. This is directed by Robert Schwentke and it stars uh, Max Hubacher and Frederick Lau. Another one that is lightly based on true events. This is the story of Willie Harold who uh, was in the German army in World War II. He was a Nazi. He was a deserter. He did not want to fight. The film finds him um, on the road. You know, he has just deserted, and he's kind of like, what do I do now? He comes upon a car with a dead man in it. The dead man was a Nazi captain. So our deserter fellow uh, takes his uniform, finds out that fits him perfectly, and ends up masquerading as the captain. Um, another group comes and finds him. He pretends to be the captain, and it kind of snowballs. Now, there are comedic parts in this film, but overall, it is a very serious drama. This is about Nazis in World War II, and you're not going to get a ton of laughs. Um, it's not the producers. Basically, what happens is 
he ends up having to play the role of the captain and in so doing pretty much becomes a Nazi captain and does all these horrible, horrible things, uh, kills a bunch of people, and etc. The end, um, I was a little confused by because it's one of those that gets a little artistic and ambiguous. Um, he is discovered, put on trial, escapes through a window, ends up wandering through a field of bones, which, you know, represents everything that he's done. Um, but basically, it does tell us that what really happened was he and his fellow accomplices were uh, put on trial and killed for everything that they did. So it is a very serious film, um, but it's also, it's it's very good. It's very well done. It's one of those that, you know, doesn't shy away from all the horrible things, which it shouldn't. Um, so difficult watch, but important watch. Um, the performances are fantastic. The cinematography, this one is in black and white. And uh, the cinematography plays to that. Um, lots of gorgeous night shots with the lighting just right how you want it. This one is in German. Uh, many of these... Uh, for like uh, Legend and Butterflies in Japanese. So, you know, there are a few foreign films on this list. Perrier's Bounty is in English, but, you know, lots of thick Irish accents. So uh, beware of that going in. Coming back to the good old U.S. of A, we have The Midnighters. This is a 2017 American independent film directed by Julian Fort, featuring Leon Russom and Gregory Sims. Um, not a lot of big names here. Independent, independent, independent. Thusly, there are no uh, awards that I can find, and I can't find much about this film in general, um, which might also be due in part to the fact that there was a film released a year later called Midnighters, which was a little more popular. However, this film, The Midnighters from 2017, is worth seeking out. It is, it's just, okay, let's start, <laughs> let's start with the plot. Uh, this film is about a, uh, an aging convict who has been in jail for, hmm, what, 25 years, something like that, for a thievery, a, a bank job or something like that, and uh, he gets out and is prepared to just live his life quietly, quietly. He's 70 something. He doesn't, um, he would like to go and find the cash that was stolen because it was hidden, but it turns out the, the money is gone. So he's like, okay, whatever. I'm, I'm older. I just want to, you know, lean back, relax, live my life in peace. He is prepared to do that. But of course, Events conspire so that he can't do that. He reconnects with his estranged son, who was four years old when he went to jail, so he never really got to know him. It turns out the son wants to follow in his footsteps and is planning a heist. So his dad joins in because he knows that his son is definitely going to go through with this, and he wants to kind of be there to protect him because otherwise he's going to get somebody else who might not do as good a job. The heist uh, goes through at the end and the, it's so well done it has a lot of uh basic heist tropes to it um the twist i should have seen coming far away and i didn't this film is so tight it is well directed it uh you know the script might be a little thin it's just you know it's a basic type of story really but you know it's it's not a bad script and the performances are on point everybody i swear Everybody is giving 110%. There is intensity. There is presence in the scenes, especially with the father and son. It just, everybody showed up and was ready to work. I, I want to go watch this film again. It's that good. Uh, the only thing I would say is that there are a couple scenes where the cinematography for me was a little bit lacking. The lighting was a little bit off. Um, <laughs> but that's it. I mean, I'm, I'm nitpicking here. Um, it's really good. Search it out. Go find this one and watch it. Jungle, a 2017, my God, 2017. What was going on that year? Uh, Australian co-production. This is directed by Greg McLean, and it is based on true events from the early 1980s. It has Daniel Radcliffe, Thomas Kretschmann, and Alex Russell. 
This movie is set in the Amazon, although it was filmed in Australia. Uh, that was probably easier. Um, the locations are beautiful, though, and stand in wonderfully, as far as I can tell, having never been to the Amazon. Daniel Radcliffe plays an Israeli student, and hmm, I, I feel like with current events and all, just saying the word Israeli is going to get me booted off of YouTube. Oh, jeez. But this is set in the early 80s and has nothing to do with current events whatsoever, or really very much to do with Israel. He just happens to be from there. He has decided to go and travel the Amazon lifelong dream, you know, type of thing. He meets up with... Um, Swiss fellow Thomas Kretschmann, and they become friends. Then they meet up with Alex Russell. So they are this group of young guys uh, out for adventure. And Radcliffe, in the little town where they're staying, meets another man who um, is this rugged individualist type of guy. And he says, I am a guide. I can take you through the rainforest and introduce you to this tribe who not very many people get to see. And the guys are all excited, like, yes, let's go do this. So they go off in the rainforest. They meet a, they do meet a tribe um, and see lots of cool stuff. And they're all very excited. Well, one of them gets injured and is having trouble walking. So the other two are getting a little impatient. And they say, well, let's make a raft and go down the river. So they try that. But it turns out their guide has a fear of water because he can't swim. So he refuses to go any further on the raft, especially since they're coming to an area where there are rapids coming up. Impassable rapids. They decide to split up. The injured man and the guide uh, decide to keep walking it's only a few days to the village, so they'll get there. The other two decide to chance the rapids and go on a raft. They figure out a way to go a little ways, avoid the rapids, skirt around it, and then continue. Well, of course that doesn't happen. The rapids come upon them before they know it. They The raft gets torn up, and Radcliffe gets separated from his friend and has to figure out how to survive in the Amazon on his own. He does know how to get to a village, but it is many miles away and he has next to no supplies. So this is a very harrowing journey <laughs> that he goes through. Now his friend who he got separated from does get rescued initially and goes back to a village some miles up the way and is insistent on going back for his friend. That is how Radcliffe eventually gets rescued because they do their paths do against all odds intersect so he does get to go home the main draw here first of all Radcliffe's performance I mean he has become such an actor I will watch anything that he is in it's just he really goes above and beyond it's very intense and very strong the cinematography as mentioned is they are taking advantage of that location every way they can. They are they're just gorgeous shots of the forest, um, Australian forest. But it's still, it's still gorgeous. And third of all, the fact that it's based on true events, which I didn't realize until the end of the movie. And I was like, what? This guy actually went through it. And the, the part that really gets you is that when they separated from the guide and their other friend, those two never came back. Nobody knows what happened to this day. That, wow, that was just got right here, right at the end. Frost Nixon, 2008 film directed by Ron Howard, starring Michael Sheen and Frank Langella. It's Langella, right? Not Langella. This is based on true events, yes, but also a play... The play also had Michael Sheen and Frank Langella. They are reprising their roles. This one kind of underperformed at the box office. It uh, was kind of hit or miss with the critics. And it did get nominated for many major Oscar categories, but failed to win anything. I know this is heavily fictionalized. I found it fascinating because I was um, not around during the Nixon era, so I didn't know. I knew the very basicness of the story, uh, but I didn't know a lot of things that happened and not much about Nixon himself. So definitely not anything about David Frost. So, you know, as a... Uh, introduction to them, I guess, and this whole 
Watergate business, um, I found it very interesting. It's it's a very well-made film. I mean, Ron Howard does know how to make films uh, by this point, and the actors certainly know their business. It was another one where it was kind of neat to say to see, oh, hey, it's got this actor in it and this actor, and yeah. So it was a uh, a Hollywood biopic, heavily fictionalized, but also yeah, I I quite enjoyed it. That's what eight, two more to go. Oh my gosh! Okay, I'm getting older now. I'm kind of going, kind of going backwards. Uh, the next one is Fitzcarraldo from 1982, directed by Werner Herzog, and featuring Klaus Kinski and Claudia Cardinal. Again, what I didn't realize until I did research for this video was that it originally starred Jason Robards. He got sick halfway through filming and had to be replaced. Um, Herzog did decide to replace him with Kinski, but he and Kinski had never really gotten along and things did not improve on this film. The struggles of this production are actually documented in an accompanying documentary, Burden of Dreams, so I may have to watch that. Again, this film is inspired by true events, something I did not know. This film I found a little hard to follow, if only because I read the description first. Kinski stars as an Irishman with his thick accent. Yeah, okay, okay, sure, Irish. Um, he is an opera nut. Absolutely, like, you know, something's a little off about this guy. He loves opera so much. He is determined that he is going to be this great philanthropist and bring opera into the jungle. That is what I thought the movie was about. And it kind of is. But the movie is about him getting the funds or trying to get the funds in order to make that happen. What he does is he gets a large boat and agrees to go and harvest rubber and bring it back and that will get him lots of dough and he can make his opera house. The way he decides to do it is he goes down one river there's no good way to get to that to the uh, other side of the river there's like this big swath of land in the middle um, kind of kind of an island thing in the middle. And he decides to go down the one river, stop partway, and take the boat over the land, over this giant hill, come down the other side. It's like, it's avoiding, I think it's avoiding a, a tribe that's unfriendly or rapids or both. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Watch the movie and, and find out for yourself. But anyway, what they go through to get this thing over the hill. And the fact is that he doesn't even make it. <laughs> he doesn't even manage to do it. So at the end, he gets an opera company, puts them on the boat, and takes them down the Amazon so he has managed to accomplish his goal. Anyway, it is a pretty out there nutty idea. And again, it's based on true events about this guy who took the boat and went over land with it. So pretty cool, I thought. Um, again, lovely cinematography. I really enjoyed it. The thing that bothered me, um, the one thing that really bugged me was that this is one of those 70s slash early 80s films with terrible dubbing. I mean, yeah, it's really obvious. Every line is overdubbed and it's it's really, you know, the, 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 the words sync up with the lips just fine, but the sound is not the same quality that it should be. So that's that, but you get used to it. So overall, it's just, it's a neat little film. I don't know if I could say little because it's a bit long, but mm. other than that, it's, it's quite a concept and quite a ride. Last one is Z or Z, if you will. This is a 1969 French and Algerian co-production. It is directed by Costa Gavras and has Jean-Louis Trindignan. I have only ever seen that name written. Uh, it also has Irene Pappas and Yves Montan. Their roles are slightly smaller. There's a lot of people in this film. This one is also based on true events. This one is also based on true events from something that happened in 1963, Greece. It was also nominated for Best Picture and for Best Foreign Language Film, which it did win. 
This one is a political drama about an assassination, the leftists and the rightists, and um, there's a police conspiracy um, that it doesn't seem is going to get uncovered until Jean-Louis comes in as the local magistrate. And he is fantastic. Just the moment he comes into the scene, you're going, oh, this is the guy. This is the guy who's going to figure it all out. And he does. He does. He untangles the entire thing just by going in and doing his dang job. So it looks like everything he pushes on, even though everybody's trying to push him back and says, I'm just going to follow the evidence and do my job. And it's fantastic. So he uncovers the conspiracy, puts the conspirators on trial, and um, that goes through. Unfortunately, it is revealed at the end that um, things being how they tend to go, the um, police, or it's the members of the military who were put on trial, um, basically get let off with a warning. Um, they then have to drop out of the military, I think. I think they do have to do that. However... Um, the people who they were conspiring against, uh, end up meeting with tragic accidents. So they won, but they didn't at the same time. So, wow. It, it's, it's, it's such a good movie. I really enjoy it. The pacing keeps up, you know, as a political drama doesn't sound that exciting, but it really is. It really is very good. Like I say, the performance, especially Monsieur Jean-Louis, fantastic fantastic and it's wonderfully shot there are some great moments so that's it those are the 10 films i'm going to highlight from this year i i know i've watched more some of them better than others so you know there are some i purposely didn't highlight and some that i've highlighted in other videos so i didn't bring them in here and then some that i've probably forgotten about so say la vie so did you catch the thing that um a lot of these are based on true events. And again, this is not something I did intentionally. I don't tend to seek those types of movies out. But it just, it's the biggest coincidence in the world. <laughs> so that's my 2024 list, I guess. Um, so let's meet back here again next year and see what else I come up with. Do you have any suggestions for me to watch next year? Oh, I'm excited to find out. But really, I, I think this was a good time to do it because pretty much we're getting into November and in December it's just Christmas films all the time. So I'll probably do a separate video on that. So but until next time, um, drink lots of water and relax if you can. I know there's a lot going on right now. Um, but to your best, um, yeah, I will too. Uh, so interesting times. Um, so I do hope you have the best week that you're able to. And I'll see you back here next time. <laughs> Bye.